Hello everyone, and welcome to the fifth and final episode of An Outside Opinion. This is a series of interviews I will conduct about Ukraine in a global context. My name is Oleg Rybachuk, and I am the host of this Centers of United Actions initiative. My guests are international experts, diplomats, and researchers that represent states with successful democracies and working system of checks and balances. They know a lot about Ukraine and have extensive expertise in global politics, security, and the work of democratic institutions. Today, my guest is Ivona Reinhardt, the deputy editor-in-chief for New Eastern Europe, news magazine dedicated to Central and Eastern European affairs, which is published by Jan Novak Zeransky College of Eastern Europe in Wroclaw. This is a Polish-based NGO think tank. Hi, Ivona. I wonder what are your personal impressions about this one year or more than one year's war uh, since uh, uh, Russians attacked Ukraine? How do you see, how you personally felt this war there? I was indeed um, in Donbass uh, a month before the full-scale invasion started. I went there as a journalist to investigate it, whether uh, the invasion will start or not. Um, so that shows to you that uh, for me, this war is, of course, a professional um, topic, one that I um, focus on every day um, since 2014. Uh, but especially since 2022. But it's also a personal topic uh, for me. I am um, a human being. So in addition to being a journalist, I have also many Ukrainian friends. Some of them are very dear friends. They turn out to be refugees in my own apartment in Krakow. Um, so, so this war was, uh, the full-scale invasion uh, especially, was uh, um, something that occupied me uh, immensely, professionally and personally. Personally. Um, I was involved in, in many humanitarian activities here in, in Poland, uh, assisting uh, Ukrainians. Um, and I was also working professionally to spread the, the word about Ukraine and the situation to the Western world. Um, today, after one year, um, of course, we are slightly less occupied with the humanitarian aspect. Uh, many refugees either returned or settled down. Um, we haven't stopped uh, talking and analyzing the situation in Ukraine professionally. Um, right now, we are seeing um, that we are one year um, into the war. The situation is very difficult in, in Bakhmut. We are we're waiting for for a breakthrough moment. So so right now we are at this waiting um, uh, uh, moment and uh, hoping that that this war will indeed end this year because we understand more and more that the longer this war um, continues, it will be more and more difficult for Ukrainians, for the Ukrainian state, but also for the Ukrainian people. Um, so, so it is in the great interest of, of everybody, uh, especially in Ukraine, but I believe also in Europe that this war um, ends, uh, ends rather sooner than later. Um, and I think this is, uh, one, this is what I can say one year after the war started. In this one year, Ukraine managed not only to stop Russian invasion, but uh, we liberated more than 50% of initially occupied territories. In your opinion, what is the reason? What helped Ukraine to do this? I know that people, in, especially in the West, were surprised. The belief was that Ukraine might not be able to withhold the aggression. I personally was not surprised, and I think the Polish people were the least surprised, because um, we uh, the knowledge about Ukraine and Poland is it's much deeper. We know that Ukrainians uh, are very self-aware as a nation. Um, you you have the strength and determination, but you also Ukrainians know who they are. And um, I did a lot of research into uh, Ukrainian um, revolutions, especially revolution on granite, revolution, orange revolution, and the last Maidan. Um, and from the interviews with the participants of these uh, revolutions, I could see that Ukrainians have a clear definition of who we are. And in Poland, we recognize this. I remember we had a discussion um, on the 30th anniversary of Polish-Ukrainian uh, relations. 
which was in December um, 2021. Poland was the first state that, to recognize Ukraine's independence. And uh, we talked about this as neighbors, um, which is not so obvious because, uh, you know, our relations were also sometimes complex and not always uh, pleasant. But we talked uh, during that discussion as neighbors. And we said um, then, we understand that your house is not always perfect, but this is your house, you are building it, and this is um, you have a right to build your house the way you want it, and we as neighbors recognize this, and we have our own house. Unfortunately, Russians do not treat Ukraine uh, as uh, neighbors with their own house. Uh, they showed that they violated uh, this uh, house. They don't respect um, this uh, right of Ukrainians to have their own land or metaphorically put it house um in poland we do and uh, for that's why for us it was not uh, a surprise that uh, with such determination courage and uh, self-awareness of uh, being a nation independent nation ukrainians um, defended their are defending um, their country you're right it's absolutely essential uh, for ukraine and one of the reasons why we were able to 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 be so resilient is this huge Western assistance where Poland is playing a leading role. And Poland is playing a leading, a leading role in many aspects. Sometimes you are acting as an icebreaker and then help uh, Western alliance to reach new level of Ukrainian support. Why do you believe this war became essentially your war, I mean, Ukrainian war becomes became like Polish war. My daughter and her family are in Warsaw. I quite often visit uh, Poland. I know that practically every, without exaggeration, every Polish citizen believes that we are fighting a common war. Why do you believe Poles take this war as their own? Well, uh, historical experience, of course. We understand Russia as an aggressor state. We recognize Russia as an aggressor state already in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea, with the war of, of Donbass. Poland already then was championing um, uh, Ukraine's territorial integrity on international platforms. So uh, the most recent history shows that we've stood behind Ukraine uh, since to, since the beginning of this aggression, and we took the active role. Um, we also recognize that a threat uh, that Russia poses in Ukraine is a, a threat to our own security. But of course, historical experience dating back to World War II, to the 19th century, um, Poland has also experienced uh, Russians' uh, imperialistic um, ambitions, uh, behavior. Uh, uh, we also lost our territory uh, to, to Russia. We experienced um, the totalitarian regime of uh, the communist times. Uh, we, we have the experience uh, with the Red Army during uh, World War II. So in Poland, uh, if you are even educated at the high school level, nobody needs to explain it to you that Russia is an aggressor state. Mm, um, that is why uh, uh, we intuitively even understood that in the beginning of the war. We um, also experienced um, ag uh, unprovoked aggression during World War II. So for us, it's very easy to, um, to feel empathy towards the victims, uh, towards those who have been unprovokedly uh, attacked and towards those who to, against whom aggression is being used, like rape, like uh, murder, um, like uh, destruction of um, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is why uh, Poland, um, so Poland understands and Poland uh, is afraid of, of, of uh, the aggression to, to spread um, beyond Ukraine. Uh, in Poland, we also understand that if this aggression is not stopped in Ukraine, Russia will go further. Um, and and this is what we are um, also saying loudly at the international level. The war is going more than a year now, and well, we all wish it to end as soon as possible. But we can realize that it can drag on uh, maybe another year. Nobody knows. Uh, in the West, they start talking about fatigue from this. Uh, many politicians, I just came from US, are trying to speculate about uh, 
need for Ukraine to stop the war at any cost? Do you have in Poland voices of those who believe that uh, well, Ukraine should stop the war at any cost, that that can save well, your taxpayers' money, your budget? Do you have that fatigue in Polish society? On a mass scale, absolutely not. Um, but we are a democratic society, we're a democratic country, so of course there are all kinds of voices. And there are voices um, saying specifically, this is not our war. But this is so marginal that I don't even uh, know if it would be 1% of the society, maybe less. Uh, we also question the sources of um, uh, that th this kind of messages are coming from, who sponsors them. Um, but but th there is this, this super, super marginal group like this. However, on the mm, in its mass, um, the society at large um, is not uh, tired of the war. The, the, the society understands that the war needs to be won by Ukraine. Um, the society is, of course, tired of the economic situation uh, because Poland has been affected neg negatively as well, especially with energy prices, um, especially with very high inflation. Um, so, so the support towards Ukraine, especially fighting the Russian aggressor, has not gone down significantly. It has gone down a little bit, but it was extremely high um, in the very beginning. Um, uh, and and Poland, uh, uh, for the moment, is uh, is strongly supporting Ukraine militarily, especially and understands that uh, that it needs to win the war. Our major geopolitical ambition uh, to start negotiating uh, with EU accession um, in, in this year. Uh, I, I am the person who introduced in Ukraine position of Deputy Prime Minister for European Integration after the Orange Revolution. Two years before Orange Revolution, I was visiting Poland and I was specifically studying your experience. I was meeting with those young Poles who've been, who created this engine, this Euro Integration Committee. In your opinion, do you believe in Ukraine's ability, because my government is very ambitious, saying that they can do it by the end of the year, and even if they can do it, meet all the requirements, what is your feeling? as a part of EU, European bureaucracy, are they prepared to start negotiations uh, this early? This is a difficult question because I'm not an EU uh, bureaucrat, but I think you will not know until you try. So I, I would definitely not discourage Ukrainians from trying uh, because somebody is an EU demo, uh, bureaucrat and might not understand. I don't think that there is ever, I mean, I would never be waiting for the good time to come because if we wait for a good time to come, we can be waiting for 10 years and Ukraine does not have this time, um, this 10 years to, to wait. Yes, it's like waiting for a child. You, if you, Especially if you're a professional woman, you always think there is a better time. Sometimes you just have to take a risk. Um, I think Ukraine uh, proved to the West that it can defend itself um, in terms of defense of its territory. Um, I think Ukraine can prove to the West that it is also determined to join the uh, European Union by uh, by introducing reforms, by by taking this path, and um, and by actions, by these activities, convince even those who are not necessarily convinced. Of course, I also hear the voices that Ukraine is not meeting the requirements and it will not meet the requirements. Forget about this. Um, but Poland in the 90s was also not in a perfect situation, but our determination to, to join the, the, the European Union and to join the structures um, uh, what was what was what would um, made it happen. Um, uh, this is what how we convinced the society to even tighten the belt uh, of course, there is always a price for that, but uh, because reforms are painful. But um, I, I would uh, definitely encourage Ukrainians to to continue on the European path. Yeah, I vividly remember, like a, like a photograph. I arrived in in Warsaw. I was member of parliament, and I was in your president's palace, and the whole center was there were helicopters humming, and I asked what's going on. Lots of police, and I was told that Polish farmers 
and coal miners were protesting against Poland joining EU because they believed, and you know, they've been so much afraid. So I perfectly remember this, and that that time your government was uh, demonstrating political will. My government is also prepared to do so. But I would like you to to think about this point. Uh, you went through unpopular reforms and you succeeded. For my government, for Ukrainian authorities, they are speaking about reforms in the war time. And this is major question. Do you believe that still, war or no war, uh, is it possible to implement reforms? Because without reforming, it would be very difficult for Ukraine to, uh, to expect beginning of association talks till the end of this year. So war could be an excuse, in your opinion, or not? Of course, I will answer this question only theoretically because I do not live in a country with war and I don't govern a country that's at war. Uh, so I can only respond to you from my sort of democratic values perspective and uh, uh, and uh, what I think uh, would be good. But uh, as I said, I am doing the disclaimer. I, I live in Poland, which is not uh, at war. and but, but I understand this challenge. I would say yes, because Ukrainians are already making a huge sacrifice um, living in a country at war and defending this country. Um, I think one of the things that um, keeps people People believing and not losing hope in the future is that this future will be better for them. Um, so if the if the state is on a path uh, of modernizing itself, on reforming, um, I believe that for the society uh, at large, this is an impetus, this is a reason to also live and fight that we will not only defend our country, that, but also that we will make our country better. Knowing Ukraine and, of course, loving your country, I, I also am aware that it was not perfect. No country is perfect, but this country was not perfect before the war. So any improvement, especially in sectors uh, and uh, something that will improve people's quality of life, it's the most desirable, um, even if the cost is, of course, a sacrifice, yes, like, like you said, and it generates some fears. But I remember from the last Maidan, uh, the slogan was to, to be in Europe and to live like in Europe. And, and I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I remember it was quite strong of a, of a desire uh, in Ukrainians. So I think to mm, deprive people of uh, this uh, dream mm, to live like in Europe and, and to live in Europe um would not be would not be good for um, for the state building and for the nation building further on you know that during war time it's quite natural ukraine or no ukraine uh civil society voluntary sacrifices part of their freedoms uh kind of put maybe internal censorship on certain criticism of the government because because there is a war so in your opinion what where you can find this balance where uh war no war government should be accountable should be kept accountable uh, maybe less maybe not so aggressive but do you believe that uh, Ukra civil society should keep trying keep should keep trying to focus on what government does, and if something is moving in their own direction, loudly speak about this, letting government know that they 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 are doing something wrong. I think so. I actually think, uh, especially in Ukraine, we see that the civil society is the we can say creme de la creme. Yes, the most devoted, the most uh, idealistic, altru altruistic uh, people, volunteering their time, their effort, their lives uh, quite often. Mm, I think the the clue the, that we should adopt here, um, whether to be silent or to talk, uh, uh, to speak up, is uh, love to your country. If you are speaking up, even against the government, because you love your country and you are doing it for the best of Ukraine, you're doing the right thing. Um, if, if you uh, don't speak up because you uh, because you sense that this could harm your country right now, 
is you are also doing the right thing. But I think in uh, um, in even in a war situation, we cannot eliminate um, criticism, critical thinking, criticism, and freedom of speech. Um, of course, it can have different um, nature. It can be of different nature than it is during. Um, non-war uh, time during peace time but um at the same time to to give up this value that would mean that ukraine is giving up democracy uh because uh, freedom of speech uh and uh, controlling of the government by the people is what democracy is all about um and ukraine as far as i understand is is showing that it's a democratic country, unlike the aggressor, which is an authoritarian regime. Um, that is why I think even if it generates certain costs, uh, standing, sticking to democratic values is extremely important. You partially touched upon this issue, but I would like to ask a general question. In your opinion, what is the biggest challenge or threat for democracy uh, uh, in the country which is at war? Freedom of speech. Mm, I understand the unity around the flag, um, especially in the early stage when everybody is in the state of shock and uh, the whole country needs to be united and uh, especially uh, around the authorities. However, as you said, we started this conversation by saying we're already mm, a year into this war. We don't know how long this war uh, will last. So to eliminate freedom of speech at the time, um, at the moment when we know that it might last for another year, I, I think this is uh, this this would be problematic and uh, and have negative consequences. So so if you ask me what is um, the greatest challenge, yes, that was the question um, uh, to democracy. Uh, I would I would say it's uh, protection of freedom of speech. Today, Ukrainian public opinion, 86% of Ukrainians support uh, EU integration. It was never so high. But I perfectly realize, as somebody who knows very well what we are talking about, that when it comes to actually implementing number of reforms, when we have to harmonize Ukrainian legislation, uh, well, number of stakeholders would feel pain, and it is not easy. Uh, we have now kind of idealistic vision of what does it mean to be in Europe, but you have, like, like you are seriously sick, you have to do a lot of efforts to become healthier. Uh, Poland went through this. I mentioned concerns of, 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 your, uh, of your farmers, of your coal miners, and I'm pretty sure that Poland went through some painful reforms. But from this experience, what would you suggest Ukrainian government should do to maintain this high level of uh, EU accession support among Ukrainian society? I think the government needs to present it to the Ukrainian people why Europe is the only choice, not only the best choice, but the only choice. Because what is the alternative? What is, if not EU integration, what is the alternative uh, for Ukraine? When Ukraine looks east, I don't think this is a choice for anybody anymore in, in Ukraine. Yes, so coming closer to Europe, integrating with Europe, becoming a member of the European Union is 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 the uh, the choice uh, which is the national interest. To understand this, uh, Ukrainians um, need a clear message uh, from the government what Europe is all about. And I think here maybe we failed as Poland. We uh, focused on the technocratic side, we focused on the laws, on adjusting the laws, but we did not spend enough time talking about European values. Mm, as you, uh, I'm sure you well, you know quite well, we are now in a conflict with the European Union over the rule of law in Poland. But we have a generation of young people who were already born in the European Union, um, and they don't understand the value of uh, what they have, that they can travel without passports, that they live on a continent that is uh, prosperous and uh, uh, improving uh, constantly also in terms of social services, etc. We stopped what guarantees freedom of speech, which guarantees um, all kinds of freedom. 
uh, we um, started teaching you, uh, EU about EU uh, uh, in terms of legal regulations, uh, economic maybe benefits, but we forgot about the values. And we did not, uh, we have a whole new generation of Poles who do not appreciate uh, European Union um, the way, um, for example, my generation does. We, we did not have the European Union when I was young. Um, when I was a young adult, we became a member. So for me, um, you don't need to explain it to me what value that is yeah, and what value it brought to my country. But to young people, um, we probably should, and, uh, and we have failed uh, uh, at that, and uh, as you know, in Poland, we we have many political problems inside, but also in our relations with the European Union, right. which is very saddening for me to see, for example. I know, I'm watching <laughs> Polish politics very well, but I still agree with what you are saying, and I'm absolutely uh, positive that as long, or if there is any chance for Russia to keep Ukraine in gray zone. Gray zone means Russian world. And we all understand that. And I think our European and Western partners do understand. I know that uh, next, this is the final question, but I would put it generally. Uh, we all felt shortage of security. The Russian invasion has shown that international security system even NATO was not prepared for this outrageous warfare. I am personally very much surprised that the whole... Well, can you imagine the, 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 the biggest union of democracies and economies, the biggest military alliance is running out of ammunition. It means that people were not prepared, even U.S., even in U.S. they have to now to increase. And Poland, by the way, is the number one country. You clearly realize this and you, you are leading here. You increase your military budget. You are upgrading your army and your ambition is to be, uh, if not one of the, if not the biggest, but one of the most powerful armies. And you openly know who is your enemy. But what do you think? Is this danger realized on the continent, what can make us feel secure? Because in Ukraine, we clearly realize it's not enough to kick uh, Russians out of our territory. Uh, they would, well, Putin or no Putin, it will take this some, some time, but if they are not uh, drawn to responsibility, if Putin is not sitting in hate and all his commanders, if they are not denuclearized, if they are not demilitarized, if they would get the chance to recover, they would and would attack again. So, in your opinion, what kind of measures, changes should be there in security system? Because uh, Russian war showed that international security system collapsed and now Poland is demonstrating your response, but Ukraine has similar ambitions. Even if we are making it to EU, you perfectly realize that European family should feel secure. What, what do you believe, how it should look in general terms, this post-war after Ukrainian victory uh, security system in Europe or maybe even in the world? Well, difficult question, uh, yeah, because I'm not, <laughs> not a security specialist. You know, I still believe in NATO, to be honest, and I still believe that Ukraine should join NATO. Um, and uh, and I am really hoping that it will join NATO soon. Uh, so I would not put NATO out of this picture. Uh, what I would maybe stress would be bilateral alliances, like Poland-Ukraine. Yes, you mentioned Poland has strong army. Ukraine now will have an extremely experienced army. Um, so, so I can see benefits from cooperation. And, and we have this cooperation. I, I believe there is this brigade, um, Polish, Lithuanian, Ukrainian. Yes. yes. So, so definitely there are these good examples to follow uh, or to continue and develop further. However, let's be realistic. We, we have no chance Polish, Lithuanian, Ukrainian uh, uh, cooperation vis-a-vis -vis NATO. So so we have to have the U.S. always um, on our side, let's put it this way. Uh, 
Um, I'm a little worried about some um, multilateral regional um, alliances. Like, for example, we have very bad experience with V4. Uh, Visegrad uh, 4, yeah. Um, initially, good idea. We are similar countries. We should, we're thinking in similar terms. And now, after years, we see that we have Hungary. Now, Slovakia is also turning uh, towards Russia. Yes, we are quite worried about this. So, maybe I would put uh, emphasis on bilateral, uh, to be honest. Uh, maybe three uh, countries that would uh, strongly be committed to, to the same, uh, to really strongly and really committed to the same uh, cause and uh, show the same, um, the willingness to, to make the same commitment. Like you said, Poland is committed to, to have a strong professional army. Um, so if other countries are um, committed like this, that would make a really reliable partner for, for Ukraine. Um, because just the partners, because we are in the region, that's not enough. I would say this this is not enough for us to 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 make alliance just because we think we are similar. Um, so so if we build anything, uh, I would start from small and and maybe expand, but to to make sure that we really are tightly together in terms of security. We see now a lot of similarities with the Baltic states. Yes, uh, they have the same threats. Uh, they experience the same uh, fears. Uh, we now talk about ourselves as frontline states and, and we, we see that this uh, Russian threat is uniting us. So, so I would maybe go along this line uh, of this uh, frontline states right now. Yes, where we directly feel Russia uh, could pose a threat also on our territories. You should have no doubt that our goal is to be a member of NATO. But you mentioned Hungary. We know that Putin is uh, using... You, you, you see situation with Turkey and Sweden on membership. So the, the procedure of getting membership is such that any member can, if not block completely, then delay. So we, we were thinking about uh, intermediate kind of transition. transition alliances. And you are right, there are Poles, Bolts, uh, Scandinavians. So there is kind of like <laughs> new democracies or truly democratic countries in Europe, which makes us uh, uh, much more confident in the future in security. And I had a similar uh, interview with former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Bill Taylor, and he specifically said that Ukraine should seek bilateral security arrangement as U.S. has with Israel. And so there is this possibility. And this is, again, it doesn't substitute NATO, but it is kind of a uh, guarantee that uh, before this long process, because you know ratification, it can take years, and Russia may use this opportunity. So we are thinking about this. I would like to thank you very much for, for, for being with us, you personally, in your name, all Polish people, because we feel that support. I'm pretty sure that this alliance would allow us to be true partners and to to lead reforms even in European Union and in NATO. Because again, war has shown that both EU and NATO also need reforms because all the weaknesses in this war became evident. So I wish all of us common victory. Jak казали поляки, за нашу і вашу свободу. За нашу і вашу вольність. It was really great pleasure talking to you. Thank to you all our listeners. And I also recommend you to visit CenterUA.org to learn more about us. I also invite you to subscribe to the Center's YouTube channel so you can never miss our videos. It will also be very interesting. Every visit on our site will uh, make you better informed and better qualified for any judgments on what's going on in the world.